Hello, welcome to chapter 12b, where we will cover the aorist participle. Just as a brief review from last time, uh, just to remind you that a participle is the joining together of vera verb and ad detective, uh, who together then produce what we refer to as participle or a participle. And that's because a participle is a verbal adjective and it can either modify a noun or a verb. In chapter 12a we looked at the present participle system and you looked at how participles worked and the various endings. Today in chapter 12b we're going to look at the aorist participle. When we're forming the aorist participle it's actually a little bit easier than it was than doing just the standard aorist verb. Forming the aorist participle, you begin, as we always have, with a verb stem. And then, just as you had that familiar sigma alpha ending on your aorist tense verbs as a sign of the aorist tense, that will also be here. So you'll have your verb stem followed by a sigma alpha. And then you will have a participle ending. And so in this case, let's look at the example we have here. We start with our slew stem our sigma alpha which is the indicator for us that we're dealing with the aorist participle and then in the case of the nominative which is simply a sigma and so in the aorist participle the first aorist active participle masculine single nominative lu becomes lusas okay so again just verb stem sigma alpha and your participle ending the good news is there are no augments with this participle. That's right. Although with the regular aorist uh, verb in the uh, when you were doing with dealing with that, you had to deal with the augment on the front or the lengthening. When a verb becomes a participle, an aorist participle, there is no augment for you to have to deal with. You just simply have verb stem, sigma alpha, and then your participle ending. With that in mind, let's take a look at our aorist participle paradigm. Looking at the first aorist active participle in the singular, okay. Uh, notice again that just as we saw in the present active participle, we have our masculine, our feminine, and our neuter across the top. Again, that 313 pattern, third declension, first declension, third declension across the top. And then down on the left, again, we're following all of our cases, the nominative, the genitive, the dative, and the accusative. Keep in mind, again, that the nominative singular will take its own unique ending. And so in this case, the nominative singular of the masculine is sas. And then in our feminine is sasa. And then in the neuter, it's san. And then notice that once you get into the genitive, the dative, and the accusative, just as we saw in the present participle, the pattern begins to trace itself out. In fact, if you look at what we have here, you'll notice that the endings are actually the very same endings that you had for the most part with the present tense participle. In the present tense, you had, in the genitive, you had luantas. Here in the genitive uh, aorist, you have lusantas, meaning that you have your new tau omicron sigma in your masculine genitive, just as you did in your present active genitive. The difference, however, of course, in the aorist is you have that uh, sigma alpha, which is your clue that you are dealing with the aorist. In the dative, you got your new tau iota, all right? But then the sigma alpha that precedes it lets you know that you're dealing with your uh, you're dealing with the aorist. And so notice then in the feminine again, it follows for the most part the uh, the first declension pattern, starting off in the nominative, its own unique ending, it's sasa, and then it's sases or the ace, like in the two taste to sase or to te to and sasan or tantain ta and then your neuter is san santas santi and san so saying these all together working our way across each case it's lusas lusasa lusan lusantas lusases lusantas in the dative lusanti lusase lusanti and in the accusative, lusanta, lusasan, lusas, lusan. So again, 
if you uh, committed to memory your present active participles then you'll notice that many of them are very similar to what you have in the aorist but your sigma alpha that comes between the participle ending and the verb stem is what's different here and it tells you that you're dealing with the aorist tense let's now take a look at the first aorist active participle in the plural again we got the 313 pattern your case is there on the left and notice here that what we have now looks even more consistent there is our epsilon sigma in your nominative plural that we're already used to seeing and then below that it just follows the same pattern that you're used to seeing so let's say it together lusantes lusasai lusasant lusanta that's your nominative in the genitive lusantone lusason lusantone in the dative lusasi or lusasin lusasais lusasin or lusasi and then finally lusantas lusasas and lusanta Again, your sigma alpha between your verb stem and your participle ending <coughs> is your clue that you are dealing with the aorist participle. Notice that at the top of this paradigm, as well as the singular paradigm, notice that above both of them, I have there in quotes, having loosed. And this is what you're going to actually in, uh, translate when it shows up in the predicate position. We will work on that in just a few moments. When the present participle showed up in the present tense in the predicate position, you said while loosing. In the aorist participle, you're going to use having loosed, as well as some other ways you can describe it. We'll get, that to, we'll get to that in just a moment. All right, that is your first aorist participle. And as you know, where there is a first aorist, there is also a second aorist. And so, introducing to you again our friend Baal here. Remember that Baal helps us to remember the uh, 13 second aorist words uh, that we had to learn there in the uh, previous chapter. Baal there, his stomach's increasing because he's got an internal change going on inside there. And so, what we realize then as we look at this is that with the second aorist, participle we have a verb stem with the internal change and then we have believe it or not the present active participle endings and so what that means ladies and gentlemen is is that there are Baal that is the 13 second aorist verbs that you've already learned they will only they those are the only verbs that will show up in the second aorist paradigm that you're going to use the very same endings that you already used when you learned the present tense endings and so in this case balon will become a second aorist active participle masculine uh, singular nominatives excuse me there I said plural it should be singular nominative and the good news is then there are no augments with the second aorist just as there are none for the first aorist and the good news is, is that there are no new endings to learn. If you learned your present tense endings to the participles, then you already know them for the second aorist participles. All you need to do is take the second aorist verbs that you learned and plug them into that first aorist, uh, that present tense paradigm. And so here is the example that we have. We have here using Baal again. Let's start across with the nominative and we will read them. Balon, Balusa, Balan, Balantas, Baluses, Balantas in the genitive, in the dative. Balanti, Balusa, excuse me, Balanti in the accusative. Balanta, Balusan, and Balan. All right, and again, notice the having thrown, okay, because that's what we're going to be saying when we put it in the predicate position. Looking at the plural, again, this very same endings that we had in the present tense, only these are for second aorist verbs. Again, notice our verb with the internal change without the augment, and beginning with the nominative, we say balantes, balusai, balonta. Balanton, Baluson, Balanton, Balusin, Balusais, Balusin, 
and then balantas, balusas, and balanta. One note of possible confusion here that you will want to give attention to is the date of masculine and neuter plural participle. If you look at it there in the masculine and neuter, it is balosun or balusi. It could potentially look like a third person present ending from a present active indicative verb, okay? You could, if you're not careful, parse this as a present active indicative, third person plural, they throw. But you know or you should know that it is not a present active verb because the internal change of balo, meaning that the one of the lambdas has dropped off, is your clue that you are dealing with a second aorist verb. So keep that in mind when you are looking at it. Now I've already pointed out to you the uh, issue of the having thrown which is the predicate position and that is because as you remember that participles can show up either in the uh, attributive position or in the predicate position and at times they can act as an adjective so taking a look here at the uh, participle when it is in the attributive position and it serves as an adjective notice the first example we have there on the screen halusas on through pas, the man who loosed. Now if you were looking at your paradigm on page 163, you would notice that lusas is your masculine singular nominative. And notice once again we have here the rule of agreement. We have the ha, your masculine singular nominative article. Your lusas would be a present active participle, masculine singular nominative. And your anthropos, of course, is masculine singular nominative. And so because of the rule of agreement here, then what we have is ha lusas anthropos, the man who loosed. Okay? The man who loosed. That's how you want to that's how you would like to translate this. Again, including that word who that we already saw earlier on when we talked about what happens when the article precedes the participle. Doing the same thing then in the feminine, hey blepsasa gune. If you look at the uh, paradigm again on 163, you'll see that the asa on blepsasa all right, is the feminine singular nominative. Notice again we have the rule of agreement, the definite article. He is feminine singular nominative. Gune is feminine singular nominative. And our participle is a aorist active participle feminine singular nominative. And so what you would say here is the woman who saw. You can't say here the woman who sees because that would be present tense. So make sure you need to bring in the aspect of the aorist of past tense. It is the woman who saw. Lastly, doing the same thing again, only this time with the masculine again. Uh, notice again we have the ha, masculine singular nominative. Blepsos, if you look at your paradigm on 163, it is a aorist active participle, masculine singer nominative, and then so is doulos, masculine singer nominative. So it is the man who saw. At times, as we've seen in previous examples, we do not necessarily need to have a noun or an adjective there to actually help us to uh, figure out what the sentence is talking about. We can simply have the participle and do the very same thing that we did in the previous screen. So here in the first example we have halusas, we have a masculine singular nominative article, and we have a aorist active participle masculine singular nominative all right, we don't have the word anthropos here, but we don't need it because we know that it's masculine. And so we can either say here the one who loosed or the man who loosed. Doing the very same thing in the next sentence, we got hey blepsasa, article is feminine singular nominative, participle is aorist active participle feminine singular nominative. We can translate this as either the one who saw or the woman who saw. Okay. Now, 
Keep in mind, as we saw in the last lesson, that at times the um, participle can appear in the predicate position, which means that the participle appears without a definite article preceding it. When we looked at the present participle, we noticed that the action of the participle would actually coincide with the main action of the verb in the sentence. All right. So in that case, when we had a participle in the present tense that did not have a definite article on the front of it, we would then translate it with the word while. When we're dealing with the aorist participle, then that means that the action of the participle precedes the action of the main verb in the sentence. And so we want to add something like having or after or after having or even when. An example from English would be after completing the test, I breathe a sigh of relief. The main assertion of the sentence here is I breathe a sigh of relief. The uh, participle here, completing, uh, or in this case, after completing the test, sets up the circumstances that happened or the situation that happened prior to sighing the, uh, breathing the sigh of relief, and that is after completing the test. Here then are some examples that we can look at on the screen there. You see we have he gune lusasa ta dulan edan tan apostolon. The woman, and then our participle lusasa, eris active participle, feminine singular nominative. The woman, while loosing the slave, edan saw the apostle. Okay, the woman. While lo or while loosing, or sorry, I, the woman having loosed the slave, or after loosing the slave, saw the apostle. Okay, you could even say the woman who loosed the slave saw the apostle. It does the same thing. Let's look at the uh, next one here. Uh, a pone is your second aorist active participle, masculine singular nominative, epon tauta ap el thon, having said these things, he departed. Here are some more examples from the practice exercises in your book on page 164 to 165. He akusasa tauta Elthon es tan oikon. In this case, the uh, participle ekusasa is attributive because the definite article precedes it. And so here, what we have here is a first aorist active participle, feminine singular nominative. And what you could say here is the woman or the one who heard these things came into the house. Okay. Let's take the same sentence, okay, in the next one, only this time we remove the definite article. We instead of having he akusasa, we just simply have akusasa tauta elfen estan oikon. It's in the predicate position. And now we know that what we have here in the predicate position is the circumstances which preceded her entering into the house. So we say, having heard these things, she came into the house. Another example then at the bottom, lab labontes tauta ex elthamen es tain eremon. Labontas is a second aorist active participle, masculine plural nominative. It is in the predicate position. So we will translate this as having received these things, we went out into the desert, or we could say, after receiving these things, or we could even say um, when uh, we received these things, we went out into the desert. There's a little bit of flexibility of how you translate these. But an important thing to note here is that the aorist participle in the predicate position sets up the action that precedes the main action verb of the sentence, which in this case, in the third sentence, is ex el thomen. Now, just as you learned a separate set of middle and a separate set of passive endings for the aorist verb when you were doing that, there are also a separate set of endings for the aorist participle, both in the middle and in the path. 
On your screen there, you see what we have is the aorist middle uh, participle. Take a look at this, and what you notice that across the top where it says masculine, feminine, feminine neuter, just like we saw in the present participle, it follows that 2 1 2 pattern that is second declension, first declension, second declension. So you already know all of these uh, noun endings that are on the end of this participle. All right, this is not near as difficult as when you have the third declension endings mixed in. Just as you saw in the present middle passive participle, you've got the, the telltale men. All right, that will help you to remember that you're dealing with the middle here. And as always with the aorist, you have your sigma alpha ending, which tells you that you are dealing with the aorist. So because these are the aorist middle passive, we would, we would translate these something like having loosed for oneself. So let's take a look here and pronounce them beginning with the nominative. In the singular here we have lusamanas, lusamane, lusamanan. In the genitive, lusamanu, lusamanes, lusamanu. In the dative, lusamano, lusamane, lusamano. And in the accusative, lusamanan, lusamanen, and lusamanen. Moving to our plural, again, everything is the same, the same 212 pattern that you've been familiar with from very early on in the course. The men, which is your indication in the aorist that you're dealing with the middle, and the telltale sigma alpha. Again, beginning with the nominative, lusaminoi, lusamin, that should, sorry, that should be lusamine, lusamina. Lusamanon, Lusamanon, Lusamanon. In the dative, Lusamanois, Lusamanes, Lusamanois. And in the accusative, Lusamanus, Lusamanas, Lusamana. Unfortunately, there is also second aorist. But the good news is that just like in the air, second aorist active, you didn't have any new endings to learn. You took the same exact endings that you did in the present active participle. In the second aorist middle, you take the same exact endings that you did in the present middle passive participle. So again, using one of our 13 second aorist verbs, let's use bal as we always do. We begin in the nominative, balamanas, Balamane, Balamanon. In the genitive, Balamanu, Balamanes, Balamanu. In the dative, Balamano, Balamane, Balamano. In the accusative, Balamanon, Balamanane, Balamanon. And then in your plural, Balamanoi, Balamanai, Balamana. In the genitive, bal amanon, bal amanon, bal amanon. Dative, bal amanois, bal amanais, bal amanois. And then in the accusative, bal amanus, bal amanas, bal amana. What that does mean also, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, is that you also have to learn the aorist passive participle. And this is where uh, you're going to have to learn some new endings. But just as when you learn the aorist passive verb, you learned in that case that the theta eta was the telltale sign that you were dealing with the aorist passive. It's the same thing in the uh, future, in the first aorist passive participle. And in this case, it is the stem plus a theta and then the endings. Notice again that, as always, the nominative has its own unique ending. So we have luthes, luthesa, luthen. But then when you get into the genitive, dative, and accusative, the pattern then begins to fall into place. In the genitive, luthantas, luthesis, luthesis, luthentas. In the dative, luthanti, luthese, luthenti. In the accusative, Luthenta, Luthesen, Luthen. In the plural, Luthentus, Luthesi, Luthenta. In the genitive, Luthenton, Lethusen, 
Luthasone, Luthentone, in the dative, Luthaci or Luthacin, Luthacis, Luthaci or Luthacin, and in the accusative, Luthentas, Luthasas, Luthenta. Notice at the top I have having been loosed. That is to remind you that you need to include here the word been or like we did with being to remind us that the passive tense that it's happening to the subject. Here are a couple of examples for you to be aware of or to look at. In this case we have Luthes, Hadulas, Keruse, in this case, our participle is in the predicate position because it does not have a definite article. So our Luthace participle is a first aorist passive participle masculine singular nominative. Because it's in the passive and it's in the predicate position, we then translate this having been loosed. Or you could even say after being loosed, the slave preaches as opposed to the next example where our participle is in the attributive position ha luthes ha dulas keruse all right and our participle being in the attributive position and we parse it it is a first aorist uh, passive participle masculine singular nominative we would translate this the slave who was loosed preaches. Notice that in the part the passive here we use was if it was plural we would say if it was the slaves it would be the slaves who were loosed. Okay. Finally uh, for paradigms we have to look there is a second aorist parsive participle just as we saw earlier and this shows up with grapho if you look at this what you'll notice is that it follows the same exact endings as the other passive uh, aorist participles the difference is however is it does not take a theta and that's because it shows up only with grapho and in this case the phi and the theta would collide with one another in pronunciation it would be grapheis so it's just simply grapheis, grapheisa, grapheen so on and so forth with the various uh, the various cases. I don't spend a lot of time on this because it does not show up all that frequently. So I introduce it to you, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because it doesn't appear a whole often. Finally, for this lesson, there is something that shows up that I'm going to explain to you and we're going to work with it time and again. I won't try and trick you with it but it is something known as the genitive absolute and this is when a circumstantial participle and this can show up in any verb tense participle okay but when your circumstantial participle that is the participle that is in the predicate position that is it does not have a definite article and it's modifying a noun and a pronoun but it doesn't fact function as the main subject or the main part of the sentence. That means everything's going to show up in the genitive case. And this is what we refer to as the genitive absolute. And the best way for me to explain this and how to translate it is to simply do it by example and to note to you that we will do it more than once as the course of, of this class. So uh, here's some examples and you will uh, just take your time to work with it. Notice that I have here in the red to anthropu luantas. Luantas is our participle, present active participle, masculine singular nominative. Excuse me, masculine singular genitive. All right, notice that the uh, words preceding it, the two anthropu, are also masculine singular genitive. Now, if I was to translate this literally the way it shows up, it would be of the man of loosing. That, that doesn't make any sense in English. Of the man of loosing the slave. Uh, he saw the apostle and that's because Greeks uh, create this construction known as the genitive absolute. The way we will translate this when we see a string of genitives with a uh, genitive participle we will simply say while the man was loosing the slave we saw the apostle. 
We can do the very same thing with an aorist participle, tes gunaikas lusaces, all right, an aorist active participle, feminine singular genitive there. We would have of the woman, of the loosing the slave, we saw the apostle. In this case, because it's aorist, we know that it is setting up the action that precedes the main action verb of the sentence. So in this case, we say, after the woman had loosed the slave, we saw the apostle. I introduced to you the genitive absolute in this lesson. We'll talk about it more in class. We will run across it in examples. I have to introduce it to you because it shows up in the New Testament. Uh, but we're not going to spend uh, a whole lot of time on it at this point because it would just uh, lead to more confusion. I just want you to be aware of it. All right, with that in mind, in your prep work for our class when we meet, I would like you to, of course, memorize the endings for the active, the middle, and the passive voices of the first and the second aorist participles. And I'd like you to complete 10 sentences, of uh, 10 of the chapter 12 practice sentences. Uh, go back to what you worked on last time and do numbers 3, 4, 6, 7, 10, 13, 14, 15, 16, 20, and 21. Those are the ones that I asked you not to do last time because they were the aorist. I will see you in class as we continue to work through participles together.